Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. As the saying goes, as one of your gospel writers said, where two or three are gathered, the gospel is proclaimed and shared and hearts are open and minds are uh, enlightened with your light of grace. And we thank you for this evening. Amen. Telling it like it is, is truly easier said than done. But Jesus surely told them, didn't he? Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. Do we really give unwavering credence to the world, or do we give unwavering hope and express even joy in the, the kingdom of God? Truth be told, as one of the gospel writers in Luther even echoed once, he said, We all fall short of the glory of God. It is human nature. At the end of last week's service and near the beginning of our Bible study that we had, I asked, what does unwavering hope and joy inspired by the Holy Spirit even look like to us today? What does that even seem like? Do we really understand what is being said here as the good news? Both the terms for hope and joy have been profoundly twisted into meaning entirely earthly and even transactional things for us today in this culture. For we neither can be remotely patient enough to be unwavering, yet alone harbor hope with a trust and confidence that discipleship in Jesus essentially demands. I don't know how many of you have been following the story about the judge who is demanding to review sermons uh, of pastors in the Houston area, but I recently signed a petition concerning the rights of expression and opinion. As we are all too bombarded with in today's cultural distortion of the gospel of Jesus, it's all become about politics, social agenda, and the world of the self. I am mine, the unholy trinity. I didn't sign this petition to take sides. I signed it in wondering about the future, certainty, integrity, and authority of the gospel. Something we are challenged to be stewards of, all of us. Perhaps these pastors may resort to distorting the gospel of Jesus by preaching and teaching political opinions which do not ever belong in the message, we are to build disciples with it. That is it. These are the things that Satan uses to divide people and turn people away from God. The formation of a graceless universe is one devoid of the understanding of unwavering, the reality of hope and truth, of joy, which is the awareness of grace. There may be many a sermon that my brothers and sisters in Christ may have preached this morning or this evening that uh, talk about this situation in Houston of censorship, monitoring, and justice. But what about the gospel, I ask? What is Jesus really wanting us to hear, yet alone discern as his disciples? Over and over during my spiritual formation journey, towards becoming a pastor for the Lord, I was told on many occasions by everyone except Pastor Eric, God bless him, you better stop studying the text daily. You better stop, uh, it's best for you to stop writing sermons weekly. I ask for all disciples everywhere who want to grow in their faith, why? Why? What's the reason? Controlling the living word within the heart of the believer is our human worldly mistrust in God's grace, working in, with, and through his freely responsible servants, the priesthood of all believers, period. If I were an aspiring political theologian, perhaps there would be something to fear. God forbid I influence people against the agenda of established religion. Yikes. Let's think about the Pharisees again here. They are in today's gospel, plotting cleverly to see if they can ensnare Jesus into making a political statement. Did he, however? Did we hear a political statement? I don't think so. It's interesting that they even begin their dialogue with him, essentially 
making fun or mocking the reality of the truth of who he is and what he represents. But let us remember, he was starting to win over the common folk, threatening the Pharisaic power and control to their vision of righteousness. They were Old Testament scholars, politicians, for the oppressed Israelites to keep the Mosaic laws and to keep that worldly understanding of God working through the rulers. Hitler even used it himself with distorting Romans 13, you know, authority through uh, rulers, earthly rulers. It is human nature. The health wealth gospel people, for instance, uh, they are agenda practitioners of today's culture, feeding their flocks that God's grace is purely for your gain. Gain as a distorted layer of understanding intellectual power and idolatry of the transactional world of the self, I me mine, with no accountability, with no personal sacrifice. The reality and truth of grace is joy. The original meaning of the word joy means to harbor an awareness of God's grace favorably disposed. That was, it was beautiful when I was like looking up through the interlinear Bible the other day and I was like, oh my gosh, joy literally is an aspect of grace. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that a beautiful thought? Truth be told, I have had a very difficult time in spiritually understanding joy since there's been so much unhappiness and evil and division in our world these days. I mean, my gosh, you turn on Fox News or CNN or one of the other stations, it's like, you know, it sounds like something from the book of Revelations, plagues and uh, persecution and other horrible things going on. How can I be joyful? How can we be joyful, especially when tears during petitions are flowing? Ah, did you catch that one? The play on words there? Petition. People of faith recognize that as the word for prayers, right? Composing prayers to ascend to our Heavenly Father, to hear. In a worldly and secular view, petitions are political kettle prods to influence elected officials to do our bidding. Again, Jesus is saying to us in the here and now of our very divided world, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. As a future pastoral servant within Christ Jesus Church in this world, but not of this world, we are to learn from St. Paul's beautiful, encouraging, empowering, and graceful, joyous message he delivers to the Thessalonians. He tells them, look at the good work that, that you've been doing, following uh, him, uh, Sylvanus, and Timothy, the first seminarian, their example, as he says, for the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we have had among you, and how you turn to gods from the idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. This is living into the lifestyle of grace. What do I mean by that? The lifestyle of grace is when we, our hearts and our minds and souls, understand profoundly what Jesus gave to us. It is, it is that, that very important cornerstone of discipleship, joyfully realized through the Christ-centered part, enacted into our hands and feet as a unified and partial, unwaveringly hopeful priesthood of all believers. What I say to that, amen, thanks be to God and Father, through whom we are called and commissioned, not to a worldly evangelism of our own gospel, but to the only gospel of grace, love, and mercy from Christ Jesus. Truth be told about our own gospels, how can we come to know God 
if we are at the center facing inward, we've heard that before, being curved inward, when it's the, uh, the, the selfish world of I, me, mine. Welcome and diversity are also words that have become twisted into the language of our new worldly religion, politics. Care and concern for the world is all temporal, transactional, and not really for the purpose of living into the reality of grace. If anything, perhaps, the Pharisees had it all figured out. Control, power, following political agendas, plans of action to create a state of righteousness is what life is all about. I certainly hope not. But there is that word again, hope. What is hope? A warm fuzzies word or the reality of the challenge of lived faith, discipleship. Hope is the cost and empowering factor of discipleship. It is taking up our cross and following Jesus. It is not just a Sunday only or Sunday morning reality, but an everyday reality within the lifestyle of grace. It is at this point of discerning our discipleship as well that we need to return to the cause and mission of Christ his gospel with urgency, telling it like it is. There may be no horsemen in the horizon or rivers of blood apparent, but we must face our calling and commissioning to transform not only inwardly, but outwardly as ambassadors of Christ, agents of grace. Our agenda is Christ alone in a hurting and dark world through our unwavering hope in his living and transforming word, we can shine, build, create light in our times today. Here and now, each and every one of us, we have that capacity. We can allow grace to rebuild this world through our lives, lived in imitation of our servant king, Christ Jesus the Lord.